But do you have any feelings about, about Apple as going more cross-platform, making UI Kit work on the Mac or replacing UI Kit and App Kit with something that is more unified? It's stupid not to. I mean, <laughs> you, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean the UIs have to be the same, right? But yeah. it, it, like the, the, the building blocks that are the same should be the same, you know. Like the, the classes could be the same, you know. You, you can you can refactor to a point, you know. It doesn't have to be identical, you know. But don't make it this hard. AppKit is old. Yeah, it's next old, and it you know you know it, like it, it. I'm not saying it's bad, but it, you know it's it it did its time. Christina Warren, formerly of Mashable and Gizmodo, currently at Microsoft. Can I make a real talk confession? Of course. On the last episode with the life and death of Twitter, I had all those big Twitter brains on the show, and I got them to stick around, and I asked them about the idea of cross-platform iOS and Mac development. Awesome. Yeah, it's one of those things, it's one of those rumors that's really intriguing to me because it could mean anything, right? Like, you know, and, and we'll just say, I mean, it's, it stems from a Mark Gurman report sometime in the last month. Yeah. Uh, and there's just not a lot of detail in this report. You know, it really could be like, to me, it, it, it could be, you could, we can come WWDC in June, we could look back and say, yes, everything German reported about this back in January was true, but we don't know if it's good news or bad news, right? Like bad news would be literally just sort of like being able to run the equivalent of what you see in the iOS simulator, like yes. just have like a little <laughs> rectangle, the shape of an iPhone or an iPad that runs in a window and uh, every click is like a simulated touch and that's it, right? It's, you know, and if you've ever, you know, anybody who's who's ever tried running an app, like an iPhone app in the Xcode simulator, it's a great feature for debugging, but it's horrible for using. It's because it just doesn't mesh with the mouse and keyboard paradigm of the Mac. It really is never, it it, it never feels right to do that. That would be the bad news. Just a lazy yeah. click a button in X bot in, in X code and out comes an app that technically runs on a Mac but doesn't look or feel or act like a Mac app at all. The good way would be if Apple, this is like the culmination of a years long strategy within Apple of hey, App Kit has evolved from nineteen eighty eight and its origins at Next through today in twenty eighteen you know, literally 30 years. It's it's like the 30-year anniversary of AppKit. And it's it's evolved. I mean, and obviously the, the big jump in the 90s where it went from Next Step to Mac OS X and they, they folded in and had to run alongside the Carbon APIs, you know, that it wasn't necessarily continuous, but there's a lot of similarities there. And I've talked to some developers who, you know, remember the Next Era. And, and I've said to them, like, if you think you went back to your old self and so, showed yourself, you know, modern app kit code, would you be able to follow along? And they're like, yeah, I'd be impressed by some of this stuff, but, you know, and maybe I'd have a few questions, but for the most part, I'd get it. And the reason people like app kit, a lot of people like app kit more than UI kit, like Paul Haddad and others, is that when they created UI kit, they didn't just port app kit yeah. over to run on a phone. They more or less in 2006 took, took a, okay, we've got 20 years of lessons from app kit. What would we do differently today? if we had it to do all over again, because effectively we have a chance here to do it all over again. And so what I'm hoping they're doing for the Mac is sort of drawing the same lessons of here, we have another 10 years under our belt, 10 years uh, uh, of iOS development. What can we do for the Mac to modernize these frameworks for for the next 10, 20 years that would really make lives, uh, work of the work of engineers as e as much easier today as they thought AppKit was than or UI kit was than app kit 10 years ago. My understanding, and I, it's, I think, once one degree of separation is that it's sort of like Swift and it's sort of like APFS, where Apple knows they need to mm. do something. They have several candidate yeah. projects. I believe the one Mark was talking about was Marzipan, and that may not be the one they go ahead with. But just right. because they, they did do this reorg and they are doing the code bases, and now we have messages on iOS that doesn't, is not feature, it doesn't have feature parity with messages right. on the Mac. And this is a way to solve for that so that their teams can do, and obviously it'll be good for some developers, but their teams can be much more efficient in terms of keeping things in sync and being consistent in what they in what they put out. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that, and I think that you're right. I think you actually hit the nail on the head, which is that Apple is running to, into this problem themselves, which is that they have uh, it, look as much as, as as Apple says publicly how much they care about the Mac, and I don't doubt that, and I've never doubted that. 
anyone who says they care as much about the Mac as they do about iOS is kidding themselves. So the way I look at it, and I understand completely like that Apple has, and people never understand this, but every company has limited resources because you're limited to the amount of engineers that are willing to work for the amount of money that you pay and live in the area where you require them to live. And that's in the face of being able to work in places you prefer or getting startup money with IPO potential. There's just always a limit on resources. And I look at it like, it's almost like you know you have one kid who's a grad student and is away at college and is pretty self-sufficient and another kid who's Taylor Swift. And you're like, yeah. you're, you're making millions and billions of dollars and you've got exactly. to like micromanage them every minute. Um, and if you have to choose, like, yes, I really want to be there to watch uh, you sit at college, but we're on world tour in Patagonia right now. Right, right. No, it is hard. It's hard because you're exactly right. Um, it, you don't have all the resources to do those things. And I think that's why People oftentimes, I'm not going to say uh, have shortcuts because that's not the right term, but people will kind of criticize companies. Well, why don't you maintain you know, native apps for all these different platforms? And why aren't you, you know, making everything unique? The reason why uh, you know, uh, frameworks like Electron are so popular isn't because coders are lazy. It's because they don't have the resources to dedicate teams to maintaining these things. One of the big examples to me is the Mac App Store. And you know, like whenever yeah. an engineer is hired onto that team, it's like, uh, you know, in Phil Schiller's heart, he wants you to work on the Mac App Store. But practically speaking, every engineer possible on that team had to work on that big App Store relaunch. And now maybe they'll go and work on the Mac App Store, which hasn't been updated in, what, like, I don't know, five years. Uh, but it's, yeah. it's also possible that if a system like Marzipan or whatever, the cross-platform framework that advances or replaces AppKit and UIKit, that would help right. everybody. Right. I mean, we already share all the low-level networking code, uh, all the code that talks to Twitter. But yeah, it would be nice to just be able to share more of the the view side of things, more of you know, not having to do the entire timeline over again on Mac um, just because they're totally different frameworks. But yeah, I'm not sure UIKit over on the Mac is the right solution or not. Where I see it being really, really helpful is with people who are developing cross-platform apps, right? You know, right now, if, if, you, if you've got a color in your app, on iOS, you have to deal with this thing called UI color. On the Mac, it's NS color. Right, and they're slightly different, and it's a pain in the butt to have to think about. Okay, I want red. Which kind of red do I want to make? Right? It's you. You just you don't want to have to think about that. <laughs> Same thing with you know the, like the the th simple things like table views and collection views and all of the, the ways that the data get presented. There's a lot of similarity between those two, and I and I think the Apple save everybody a lot of time and effort if they focused on you know the view aspect to it basically that every app is kind of broken down into three major components the model the view and the controller now every developer understands what those are but the, you know the model is basically your data the controller is telling you know how things are supposed to work and the view is just the presentation of the data well right now in fact, for Twitterific, this, our Mac and iOS client, they share what share the model. Right? They share the data. The data that we get on, on the Mac and the data that we get on iOS is identical. How we display it is different, right? The controllers are also a little bit different because, you know, you're dealing with different kinds of ways of, of presenting the information. But, you know, if you could have a common view on Mac and iOS that – you know, knew how to display a tweet, for example, that would save you, save us all. I mean, because we've got different, we've got different code for displaying a tweet on iOS and different code on, on Mac for doing the same thing. If, if that code could be the same, we we have, would have saved ourselves a lot of time and effort. I mean, just like we did with the model. I mean, having the model on both uh, platforms was a huge, huge thing for us, right? It, it, in fact, we're already seeing, you know, it's like, Fixing a bug in the model is like fixing a bug in two apps, right? It's awesome, right? <laughs> it's like Sean, will, will, you know, my my, uh, my uh, development partner, Sean uh, Heber, you know, he fixes something there, and you know, he's fixing something on the Mac, and he's fixing something on iOS at the same time. It's awesome. Now the controller, that's the thing where I think people are just saying, oh well, you know, that that that'll just magically work. Well, drag and drop works differently. Yes, they could probably make some of the drag and drop stuff work on iOS and the Mac 
better, right? More similarly, but you, know, you have different types of information you can drag. Being able to handle the menu bars and things like that. You know, there's no menu bar, for example, in iOS. I think that there's a lot. I think the, the, the marzipan or whatever they're, they're, I guess that's the code name for it. it I mean, they're, they're, I can see that helping a lot for people building cross-platform stuff, but I don't think it's necessarily going to be just uh, compiling your app for ARM 32 versus ARM 64, right? It, that was basically, you know, flip a switch and, hey, it works. It's not going to be like that. Every year I have, I cross my fingers hoping this WWDC is when they announce that they're actually unifying that layer. And I think that of all the things that, you know, at the end, having that layer wouldn't have guaranteed that Twitter for Mac would still be around. But by not having the layer to share more code, kind of guaranteed that it was always going to be drifting away in terms of uh, consistency. And it would just be insurmountable because... You know, the greater discussion, and I see people talking about like, well, there's nothing wrong with the Mac as a platform, right? AppKit's fine. It's great. It's true. It's got some legacy stuff. But at the end of the day, there's just so many inconsistent enough things for no good reason. Just like the coordinate systems flipped upside down. Okay. I'd run into uh, like, so when I was uh, maintaining the Mac app for a while, I wanted to get in uh, localization uh, for like a, a Japanese and I think Chinese and there was an obscure bug in AppKit that was that after talking to Apple engineers, like, oh, that has to do with the carbon background. I'm like, oh, okay. And it's just like all these little death by a thousand cuts yeah. when there's no reason you shouldn't be able to, for the core logic, like the basic you know, tweet rendering, you shouldn't be able to just say, okay, now drag and drop this into a Mac project and you get all of the at least visual uh, design. And, you know, they can still shop, stop short, similar to tvOS. Uh, tvOS doesn't allow you to it's not based around a touch interface it needs you to use the focus engine but if you're building a facebook app or an instagram client you can reuse all the rendering code you can reuse all the lower level stuff but it, you have to bring yourself that last mile to figure out what's the best way to interact with it using uh, a remote control so as long as apple stops short of like true cross compilation it's going to be outstanding some of the feedback or some of the reaction to twitter exiting mac was that what does this mean for Mac as a platform? And it was a little doom and gloomish, but I looked and Twitter pretty hard exited the Windows platform as well. They did. They did. In fact, they, they exited the Windows platform, I think, earlier. I think that the the, the, the Metro style Twitter um, app is still in the Microsoft store and, and you can like have it, you know, kind of work like on, on your start menu or whatever. But, you know, TweetDeck for Windows, which was like a, a separate Windows app, stopped being, you know, bundled or packaged separately uh, quite some time ago, I think it was a couple of years ago. You can obviously still use it in, in Chrome um, or or whatever browser you choose, but but it stopped being um, you know distributed uh, directly. There's an app called TweetIn, which is uh, basically TweetDeck, and and then they've added a couple of kind of native um, things for notifications and and whatnot that is in the Microsoft Store. But uh, by and large, you know. Um, other than kind of the very rudimentary Twitter for Windows app, which was never as robust as Twitter for Mac. Yeah, I mean, they, they've already kind of started exiting, I guess, desktop uh, even before it left the Mac um, app store. Yeah, and so I was thinking this is less a what does this mean about the Mac and the future of Mac apps question, to me at least, and what does this mean for desktop and the future of desktop apps? I would agree with that 100%. I think that it's much less a, a Mac-specific focus, doom and gloom mode. The Mac is a dead platform. That being said, I do think that it becomes a very fair question, which is to say, what is the current situation for desktop apps in general? If I'm being totally honest, I feel like the heyday of a lot of native apps on desktop is over, sadly. And when I stop to think about it, when um, and I talked to John Gruber about this too, but when I start, when I stop to think about it, uh, all of the big apps, the apps that I would consider world changing uh, on smaller or bigger scales recently, they've been mobile first. They've been things like, or at least web first and mobile first, yeah. things like Instagram. Uh, things like Uber and Lyft, even the even the wonderful updates t we've had on desktop software, things like Final Cut Pro and Pixelmator uh, and Microsoft Office, those have been a updates to old apps, not new apps that are revolutionizing things on the desktop today. You know, it's sort of like uh, to draw a rough analogy. It's like sports. You know, you need you need you kids to be playing a sport for the sport to maintain popularity. You know, and and if all of your favorite players in a certain sport all are in their you know late 30s and there's the the 22 year olds coming up aren't there because they're playing other sports that have become more popular uh, it's a problem 
Yeah, I mean, I th- exactly. And I think a great example of that is something like like Slack, right? Or or uh, to, to put in a plug, you know, Microsoft Teams, which you know is is our kind of Slack competitor, and and Atlassian has has another one, Stride. You know, those those are are web first, and obviously people package them, you know, using Electron, uh, which is the most common kind of framework, but you could kind of use anything. Or and then there are a lot of adherents, uh, you know, Google's led the effort, um, uh, and a lot of other companies are supporting it with progressive web apps uh, for for offline access and and caching and things like that. But yeah, I think you're right is that when you really kind of look at what have been the biggest um, uh, kind of uh, services, platforms, uh, apps, experiences over the last uh, five or five or so years, the vast majority have been either mobile first or web first. It's super interesting to me because when you look at Microsoft and Apple, uh, both of them have legacy desktop operating systems, but currently they have almost opposite problems. Microsoft was never as successful in mobile as they were in desktop, so they've worked on right. universal apps that would let them bring Windows over to uh, mobile. And Apple was far more successful on mobile than they ever were on desktop. And now there's rumors that they're looking at ways to help bring iOS apps to the Mac. Yeah, so I don't have a lot of experience with it, to be honest, but I've talked to a lot of developers and I think that, you know, um, the universal Windows app story is, is is pretty complex. You know, it kind of started as kind of a way to bring, um, you know, Windows desktop uh, kind of apps to, to mobile. And then it kind of shifted to saying, OK, if you have uh, more of a traditional, you know, x86 app, you can put it in, in a wrap, you know, you, you can use this bridge and you can bring it to the Microsoft store so that it can run on other devices, including things that run Windows S and potentially even other mobile platforms and potentially down the line, you know, Windows on ARM and things like that. Um, and now it's kind of opening up even further where uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Ed- Microsoft Edge team announced a, a support for progressive web apps, um, as well as the fact that in the next version of Windows 10, um, progressive web apps will be available in the Microsoft Store. And, and that's a pretty big deal because that means that people who are building progressive web apps for, for Chrome or, um, you know, uh, whatever the case may be, can now actually have these packaged and delivered and live on the desktop and, and you can interact with them like they are a desktop app. And some people are saying, oh, well, progressive web apps mean that Universal, you know, UWP is dead. And, and it's like, no, you know, I think they can, they can work hand in hand and it just depends on what tooling and what situations are better for, for what users. But, um, it's it's been interesting to kind of uh, see that approach, and when it when it comes to Apple, I think the the challenge will be, frankly, is that uh, for all the good and bad things you can say about having you know touch available on on Windows, the fact remains is that for going on five years now, you know um, Windows uh, from starting with Windows eight and and now up through you know Windows ten has supported touch inputs, and and there are good and bad things about that dual approach, but Apple has always taken a very uh, separated approach, whereas on the desktop. It is a mouse cursor and on mobile it is a finger and i think that what it, it will be uh, if mars pan or whatever it's called happens it will be interesting to see what tools they put in place and and how you know emulators and things work so that those touch points and those different user experiences are able to translate across platforms so you don't have um, kind of the experience you had, I would say, uh, when you first saw uh, Android apps uh, appearing on Chrome, which was that, you know, they weren't quite designed for for the mouse cursor um, at, or, you know, it, it, they, they didn't align with the screen well. And so it, it's, um, I think the, the, the bigger challenge is less so much sharing the code and more about thinking about what's the end user experience on these devices. And is it going to feel native or is it going to feel like, you um, you know, uh, kind of a the robot that almost looks human, but there's just a little bit of an uncanny valley that it, it, you can just tell that it's not real. Yeah, I think there's two sides. And I don't think maybe like Twitter would never come back to the Mac because they're fine with the web. But if, if the Twitter app that they built for iOS could much more easily be ported back to the Mac, maybe it's only half an engineer. Maybe that's more palatable. Yeah. Or maybe some other developers are like that. I mean, the opposite example uh, to this is tvOS, where you can, like, there's a, it, tvOS is based on iOS. You can share a great amount of the code, and we still get right. horrible Amazon Prime and YouTube apps. So maybe I don't know anything, Christina. Yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, I think part of that is there's some certain limitations, you know, with tvOS. But you're right. You're right. You know, uh, that you still have horrible things, uh, horrible, you know, uh, JavaScript laden apps. I, I would argue in, in the, the, the case of the Prime and, and, and the YouTube app um, is that, you know, their, their primary concern is to make things look the same across a million different platforms. And Apple TV has a really small user base compared to the Roku's and the Chromecast of the world. And so, again, you prioritize resources. And the rumor I heard is that the, it, it, though some engineers, of course, care desperately about the quality of their app, the product managers really flav, uh, favored portability. And so them taking Absolutely. their OpenGL code 
from whatever player and sticking on an Apple TV was a much, much like they cared about fast and cheap, not, oh, sure. <laughs> not good. So they just wanted right. to force no, it. Yeah. Which I would 100% believe in. And again, I kind of can't fault because if, if, if you're looking at, okay, I need to get a product out. It works well enough. The people who are really going to nitpick over the experience are going to be a very small subset of the users. Most users are just going to use the app. And if it has a bad interface, it has a bad interface. Um, but we're willing to forego perfection just to get the product out, um, especially if we only have X number of users and we're trying to cross-maintain a million different platforms. And again, I mean, I think this is why, even though it's, it's impossible, you know, right once run everywhere is impossible. It is why I think people are kind of moving more to trying to use shared frameworks, uh, whether it's in the web or, or mobile or whatever. So the thing that I'm hoping for is that, yeah, I, I think there'll be a ton of inertia with them, but I'm thinking someone like Greg Pierce, who makes drafts for iPhone yes. and iPad and Apple Watch and currently doesn't have a Mac app, might be he tempted enough one. to say, he, this is the, uh, now there's no reason for me not to have a Mac app. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's no reason I wouldn't want to be on the Mac other than that I haven't had the resources and the effort required is has been prohibitive, but I, I've been taking steps to get there. And over the years, they've improved a lot of the underpinnings. There's a lot of things that can be shared, but the UI is so different and the resources required to build an entirely separate UI have slowed down that process. So I'd love to see something like that come to come from Apple. Exactly. Overcast. We could finally yeah. have a, an overcast Mac client rather than, you know, the web app is great, but but we'd have a, a native one. And I think that for companies like uh, Omni, who's been basically kind of doing this on their own for five years, you know, kind of maintaining the same code base and then just having, you know, different UI stuff would maybe lessen their load and that would be great. Uh, but yeah, I, I would love to see like a Greg Pierce be able to do drafts for Mac because I would, I would kill for that. Um, and um, on the inverse side, I, in a perfect world, I would also like to be able to say maybe you have some really good Mac apps that have never come to mobile that might be able to, to come to, to iOS in better ways. I guess bottom line for me, my dream is that Craig Federighi would show up on stage at WWDC 2018 or 2019, and he would say, we've had 20 years of app kit, we've had 10 years of UI kit, and today Apple takes the next step forward. Today we announce a framework that lets you share your resources between iPhone and iPad and Mac much more easily, much more effectively, and we call it XKit, or we call it Apple Kit. Yeah, no, I would love that idea. I think that would be great. And, I, and again, I think that for developers who are really already invested in both platforms and would want to do the heavy lifting work of migrating their stuff over, that'd be great. And definitely for, for new apps going forward, that would be great. My only fear with this with this sort of XKit thing is that in my mind, I'm always afraid that that means they're going to take away some of the special things that make a Mac app yeah. more powerful than an iOS app. And unfortunately, my gut kind of tells me that if that's the case, then you would see some of the scripting things and some of the more advanced, uh, you know, system access things disappear if you were to do that, which would be okay, I think, for most apps if they didn't already have a Mac version, uh, but still, you know, makes my makes my Mac app heart hurt. I mean, we see that, or like I work, uh, they took the engine from iOS and they brought it to the Mac yep. and it was super painful. We lost everything at first. And it's even Final Cut Pro. Like, anytime there's a restart, it's like months or years in pain. Uh, but eventually it gets better. And that's my only hope. That's why I hold the hope, Christina, is that it, it would eventually get better. Yeah, no, and, I, and I, I'm certainly not trying to say that it would never get better. But I, but I think you're right. I mean, there would be pain points. But I think so. Uh, that's just my only kind of you yeah. know, having realistic glasses on face. But yeah, I, I'm with you. I think that would be great. And I think it would be good for the Mac ecosystem and maybe help revive some life into it so that if someone is building an iOS app, it's that much easier for them to say, okay, do I want to invest this many hours into also making a Mac version? Um, and and when I update things, you know, Xcode can be written in such a way that it will update things across both of them and deploy them to both stores and, and do testing on, on both types of devices. And so I don't have to do a lot of the, the heavy work that, that exists now in trying to maintain an iOS version and a Mac OS version. Well, Christina Warren, I thank you so much for your time. If people want to find you, it's at film underscore girl. That is correct. And uh, you can uh, also listen to uh, my podcast I do every week on Relay FM called Rocket. Awesome. And you're still you're still hosting the Channel 9? I am still hosting this week on Channel 9. I also host a show called Gals. We do some other things. Thank you so much, Christina. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Renee. Uh, I was convinced that they were going to go that direction in 2008, 2009. And the fact that they it took this long, I mean, I'm assuming that they're doing it. The fact that it took this long is like sort of is mind boggling. I don't understand why that why anybody there either resisted or it just I don't yeah I don't get it